My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. I'll be able to make friends. I'm just trying to save you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to teach you about days like today so you can better prepare for them. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. We cannot keep changing our minds about the Fed on a daily basis. Buy, 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 buy. It's a sucker's game, a fool's game. One that caused the averages to get clobbered today. Dow plunging 483 points. S&P plummeting 1.79%. NASDAQ nosediving 1.93%. And pretty much the exact same news that barely caused an eye to bat just last week. So before you sell everything because you think everyone else is, here's what you really need to know. The Fed has a plan. It wants wages to stabilize. It doesn't want them to plummet. The Fed wants food costs to stay the same for a little bit. It wants rents to stop going higher. It wants cheaper cars. It wants more homes at lower prices. And ideally, it wants all of these things to happen with minimal cost to you, a regular person. Although that's a tough needle to thread. It's got a hard job. The economy is too hot, money's flowing all over the system way too easily, and there's still too much spending by both individuals and governments. Now, obviously, the Fed can't do anything about the federal budget. I mean, that's why we've seen such strength in cyclical smokestack stocks of late. The ones that benefit from all that infrastructure spending, think about it, it's steel, construction, timber, doesn't matter. At the same time, the aerospace business is booming because travel remains strong post-pandemic. So the airlines need more planes, and that's how Boeing can rally two bucks on a hideous day for the averages. So while the Fed's made some progress in the war against inflation, it's probably not enough, at least not if you're taking your cue from last week's very strong employment number. So what is going wrong? Okay, what's really going wrong with the Fed? And is it going to stay going wrong? Well, first, there's not enough people who are returning to work. Not enough people want to come back to the workforce. Maybe they took huge buyouts when companies laid people off like mad at the start of the pandemic. Someone in their mid-60s who took a buyout who simply isn't coming back to work, not this close to Social Security age. There's a calculus you can do on Social Security. I bet a lot of workers decide to start taking benefits early, even if that means the benefits are smaller. I throw in the buyout on top of that, and you're fine. They're not coming back. I think this has been a real problem in industries that have struggled to attract younger people, like trucking, trains. We saw from the labor report on Friday that there's been some movement here among this cohort to return to work, but not enough to stamp out wage inflation, for heaven's sake. Second, there is a terrible mismatch between the job openings we have and the people who might be interested in them. For example, we need tons of engineers, either for the $550 billion in incremental infrastructure spending authorized last year or you know, for all those airplane engines, air electric vehicles, green energy stuff that got subsidized by the so-called Inflation Reduction Act without the people to take care of it. But we're tapped out of engineers. It takes a long time to train these people, causing an endless spiral of higher wages for anyone capable of doing this work. Those people can just name their own price, and they are. Meanwhile, not many people feel compelled to come back to work because Americans are so much richer than they were before the pandemic. Something you know if you listen to any of our interviews with Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, who ought to know he's got the facts. For roughly two years, we had almost nothing to spend our money on. And we also got a series of huge handouts from Washington. That's an immense amount of wealth creation, and it makes the Fed's job a lot more difficult. Hey, it's not, the odds are not stacked against them, but the odds are tough. Third, You know what we have? We got too many coders or people who like are near coders or something coder, you know. Uh, These are many people in the business of customer relations management, data analysis, advertising. They're hanging on by their fingertips, keeping their jobs, hoping they don't get discovered that they're doing nothing. Sure, Meta discovered it. They decided to make some big uh, layoffs because their expenses were crazily out of control versus their revenues. But most tech companies have simply failed to realize that the halcyon days are over. They're dreaming. Enterprise software isn't going to end up like coal mining or clock making or film development, but this is one of the most bloated industries I've ever come across. People are hitting the exits from some high-profile firms, including Salesforce.com. The industry is in big-time flux, like acid reflux. Plus, so many people in the software business took payment in stock as well as cash. Now their stocks are so darn low that the companies either have to make it up with more cash or make it up by massive additional amounts of stock. They've typically chosen the latter, betting Wall Street would continue to be blinded by the revenue growth and not care about the earnings 
or lack thereof. But that game ended a year ago, for heaven's sake. Sooner or later, a lot of these people will lose their jobs. It's just that many of these tech companies are too new with unseasoned executives who don't know when they need to fire workers on mass. And anyway, the workers aren't in the building, so they don't see them. Right? When you don't see them, you don't realize how bloated your company is. Like, oh, yeah, I got guys here, I got guys there. No, I mean, you're bloated. So they hold on, and the outcomes will be pushed out. Stocks that are down 60, 70 percent will go down another 10 to 20 percent, believe me, before it dawns on these executives that their job is to preserve the institution. And that can mean making some painful decisions. As a veteran of the dot-com wars, I can tell you that about 330 companies came public during the period when we brought the street.com public. And I got to tell you, most of them went under because the people in charge just didn't know what they were doing and wouldn't take the medicine, wouldn't bite the bullet, which, by the way, is not fun. And I feel badly about how many people I had to lay off. But it's the way to save the institution. Which brings me to problem number four from the Fed's perspective. The sheer number of companies that were created in the past few years uh, have pushed wages higher. Remember, between the SPACs, the IPOs, we had about 600 new publicly traded entities, a lot of employees, a lot of money, a lot of employers, a lot of jobs. Many of these companies are now hanging on by a thread, by their fingernails. But the problem is they raised a ton of money in 2020 or 2021, and the destruction of all that capital takes time. Many of these companies were rich to begin with, though. They have so much cash that they haven't been forced to pivot to profitability. After so many rate hikes, you'd think these newly public companies would be struggling to stay solvent. We didn't count on them having so much money that they think they can ride this moment out. The Fed can't just force them out of business. They can only keep bringing the pain until the money runs out and these enterprises go under. We are not there yet, though. I can't believe how many money-losing enterprises still haven't laid off anybody. But the simple fact is that money was so bountiful that they can last a lot longer than they have any right to. While the Fed can definitely outlast them, it'll be a painful experience for the whole economy. The longer these marginal businesses hang on, the worse it is for everybody else. But we can't make them surrender. Now, we can't go back and forth on this topic every day. Honestly, today's sell-off, it should have happened last Friday, when we first got that red-hot employment number. It didn't for some reason. But I come back to the fact that gaming out the Fed's next move is more of an art than a science, and artistry takes time. You've got to figure out when people will start coming back to the workforce and when money-losing companies will let their workers go or simply go bankrupt. I think it's actually going to happen sooner than expected at this point. I think we're going to be hearing about gigantic layoffs in this country after Christmas, and the turnover is already starting to occur in the last three, four weeks. Don't worry, the Fed will win this war, either patiently or with alacrity. The former is prudent, the latter is rash. Bottom line, this kind of thing is hard to pin down, especially when we're between Fed meetings. But in the end, this market's hostage to the Federal Reserve, and the Fed's not going to stop tightening until they see more evidence of real economic pain. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, but it could be a lot sooner than this market's now expecting. I want to go to Gale in Massachusetts. Gale! Hey, Jim. How are you? I am good, Gail. How are you? I'm doing great. I have a question for you. I have a bet with my husband on which button you're going to press. When I ask you, is this the time to jump on the Peloton bandwagon? You know, it's so interesting you mention this because everybody, it's now a joke. Like my wife, well, yeah, I used to say she'd put her jog bra on the Peloton. I heard someone made that joke. The other day, I said, boy, it's late in the game. I bet you this one's looking good. Because in the end, Barry McCarthy is running that joint. I'm not betting against Barry McCarthy right here. So the answer is I'm going to say is don't buy. Don't which buy. is different from buy, but different from sell. Let's go to Peggy in Maryland. Peggy. Hey, Jim. Hey. I hey, Peggy, have seven, and I love them for a number of reasons. They have a low P.E. The dividends are strong. And then oil is, I don't know if it's on fire, but it's strong. How far down will oil have to go to make dividends unattractive? 70. 70 is the, is the point where you have to start rethinking things. Uh, you know, Carl asked me this morning, Carl, can you, do, do we see the bottom in oil? I thought maybe. Uh, I don't remember. I think that we saw it when it went to the to like 72, 73 and held. I'm not giving up on it. Uh, I'm not giving up on Devin. I like Devin very much. We're going to go to Davis in my home state of New Jersey. Davis! Booyah, Jim. Booyah, Davis. First time caller. Honored to be able to say to you, my friend, you'll have a gift. I'll have the movie analyze this. 
Thank you. Great advice Thank you as very always, much. Jim. I appreciate all the foresight you've given me through the years. But tonight, I'd like you to analyze the $24.6 billion merger between Kroger and Albertson. All right, this is a very complicated situation, Davis, and I'll tell you why. Because I think the people who run the FTC is going to review this, and the the person who runs the FTC does not listen to the CEO of Kroger, Rodney McMillan, who's made a great case for this, that it would help the price of, uh, lower the price for customers. I think that she's got, Lena Khan is going to reject this deal, and they can sue, but she's a very powerful opponent. This market's hostage to the Federal Reserve, and the Fed's not going to stop tightening until they see more evidence of real economic... The house of pain. Unfortunately, we're still not there yet, but it could happen very soon. Now, on Mad Money tonight, Ulta Beauty popped after earnings. So what's bringing the strength of this cosmetics retailer? You know what? We're going to discuss with the uh, new CEO. Then, j has his sights set on taming inflation. And while chicken wings may not be his top priority, uh, I'm betting... I'm checking in with the CEO of Wingstop to learn how decreased costs are impacting the company's bottom line. Not everything's going up, thank heavens. And the software space has been a tougher corner of the market for some time. But after earnings, is there still some room for the company like Splunk in your portfolio? I'm getting the latest from the company's top brass. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.